Hello everyone, welcome to another day of learning. So today we will talk about our second lesson which is the Systemic Functional Linguistics. We have two objectives for today. Number one, to explain the approach of Systemic Functional Linguistics and number two, to apply SFL on sample non-literary texts. Let's define first the most significant terminologies in this lesson. First, we have linguistics. This is the scientific study of language and its structure, including the study of morphology, syntax, phonetics, and semantics. Let's also define these basic terminologies in linguistics. First, we have morphology. It is basically the study of the forms and structures of words. Syntax, on the other hand, is the part of linguistics that studies the structure of sentences. Phonetics focuses on the production and classification of human speech sounds, while semantics is concerned with the study of meaning in language. Another significant terminology is this course. This course basically includes talk, conversation, speech, writing, treaties, and any communicative events to name a few. Discourse analysis, on the other hand, seeks patterns in linguistics data. So, it is qualitative in nature. Sometimes it is also defined as the analysis of language beyond sentence. Systemic functional linguistics or SFL is one of the approaches in the analysis of non-literary texts. SFL is primarily concerned about language function, and language is analyzed in terms of four strata. These are number one, context, number two, semantics, number three, lexical grammar, and number four, phonology, graphology. We will better understand these strata as we go along the way. Okay, so what is the goal of systemic functional linguistics? SFL aims to explore the meaning and context through a comprehensive text-based grammar that enables analysts to recognize the choices speakers and writers make from linguistic systems and to explore how these choices are functional for construing meanings of different kinds. So here the focus is on text-based grammar. So we will try to analyze language based on its functionality and focusing mainly on its grammar. For us to better understand systemic functional linguistics, let us explore first the three metafunctions of language. This metafunction of language includes textual, interpersonal, and ideational. Textual means to link complex ideas together into cohesive and coherent waves of information. Interpersonal, on the other hand, is to enact social relationships to cooperate, form bonds, negotiate, ask for things, or to instruct. Ideational means to talk about experiences, people and things, their actions and relationships, places, times or circumstances in which events occur. To further illustrate these metafunctions of language, let us take a look at this example. There are two people who are having a conversation. One says, Robin Ho plays football. In this simple class, language encodes three types of meaning. So what are these? On the ideational level, the person who is talking is describing something. On the interpersonal level, they are interacting with one another. And on the textual level, the person who is talking is organizing his message in a linear flow. With these concepts, we are now ready to analyze text using SFL. However, how do we do this? We need to learn first grammatical cohesion and textuality which includes reference, conjunction, ellipsis, and substitution, and lexical cohesion. Okay, so what is cohesion? 
Basically, cohesion helps to create coherence. And when a text is cohesive, practically the ideas tend to stick together. Or in other words, all the ideas within the text are connected with one another. How do we make texts which are cohesive? Simply by using transitional devices. They are also called connectors, linkers, transitional words, or discourse markers. In doing as a file, reference is also an important element. The term reference is traditionally used in semantics to define the relationship between a word and what it points to in the real world. However, in Halliday and Hassan's 1976 model, it simply refers to the relationship between two linguistic expressions. There are two types of reference. First is what we call exophoric or situational. It means outside of the text. The other one is endophoric or textual, and it means inside of the text. Endophoric can also be classified into two types. First is anaphora, means to preceding, and the second one is cataphora, means to following. Again, exophoric refers to something external to the text. It also refers to the reader's general knowledge. For example, the sentence, the president ordered that people have the right to free internet connection. In this sentence, the president is the exophoric reference because here we are expected to know who is the president. It is a general knowledge that the president here is President Duterte. Another example, the sentence, For he said jolly good fellow and so say all of us. As outsiders, we don't know who the he is, but most likely the people involved in the celebration are aware of the he that is being referred to and therefore can find texture in the sentence. We have now come to the second type of reference which is endophoric. Endophoric reference can be classified into two, anaphora and cataphora. Anaphora means looking backward. It is a word which refers back to another word in the sentence. Why do we need to use reference? The simple reason is to avoid repetition. For example, Yusuf likes ice cream but I cannot eat it. In this sentence, ice cream is the antecedent while it is the pronoun reference. Another example, the student saw herself in the mirror. The student is the antecedent while herself is the pronoun reference. Therefore, anaphora means an earlier word phrase clause to which a following pronoun refers to. Cataphora is the opposite of anaphora, and it means looking forward. We use cataphora when referring to something that is not mentioned yet. It is a word in the text that refers to another to invite the reader to go forward and read to understand. For example, if you want them, there are cookies in the kitchen. Them is the pronoun reference, while the cookies is the antecedent. Here you can notice that the pronoun comes first before the antecedent. We have here examples. First, if you want some, there are carish cheese. Some, the pronoun reference comes first, followed by the antecedent, which is the carish cheese. Second example, after he had received his orders, the soldiers left the barracks. He and his are pronoun reference. They come first, followed by the soldiers, which is the antecedent. Now we can call it a postcedent.
Let's see how well you understood cataphora and anaphora. Identify the reference here whether they are cataphora or anaphora. Example, my father once bought a Lincoln convertible. He did it by saving every penny he could. That car would be worth a fortune nowadays. However, he sold it to help pay for my college education. Sometimes I think I'd rather have the convertible. Is it cataphora or anaphora? The answer is anaphora. Let's analyze the sentence. The antecedent, which is the father, comes first and then followed by the pronoun references. They are it, that, and another it. We also have another antecedent, which is the Lincoln convertible. And then it is followed by its pronoun references. These pronoun references are he, and then followed by another he, and then lastly, another he. We have another example. Identify whether this is anaphora or cataphora. She claims Leia Tolsoy is a distant cousin. Now, Tatiana Tolsoy has put pen to paper. The answer is... The answer is cataphora. Let's try to analyze the text. She, the pronoun reference, came first before the antecedent, which is Tatiana Tolstoy. Therefore, the reference in this text is cataphora. It's your turn. Identify whether the references used in the following sentences are cataphora or anaphora. K okay, number one, the teacher asked Jude to read so he read. Number two, when I met her, Mary looked ill. Number three, I gave him the bad news. The Prime Minister took it well. Now let's have a review. When we say reference, it is the relationship between two linguistic expressions. And it has two types. They are exophoric and endophoric. Exophoric refers to something that is external to the text. It refers to the reader's general knowledge. Endophoric, on the other hand, has two types. They are anaphora and cataphora. Anaphora refers back to a previous word. Here, the antecedent comes first before the pronoun reference. While cataphora refers to something that is not mentioned yet. Here, the pronoun reference comes first before the antecedent. Another important element to look for when doing SFL is lexical cohesion. When we say lexical cohesion, it refers to relationships in meaning between lexical items in a text, and in particular, contents words and relationship. Or it simply refers to the way related words are chosen to link elements of a text. In this lesson, we have two types of lexical cohesion. The first one is repetition. It uses the same word or synonyms, antonyms, etc. So let me read to you different examples of repetition in the following texts. First example, there was a large mushroom growing near her, about the same height as herself, and when she had looked under it, it occurred to her that she might as well look and see what was on top of it. She stretched herself up on tiptoe and peeped over the edge of the mushroom. This is the most simple example of repetition where the word mushroom is repeated in the text. Second example, accordingly, I took leave and turned to the ascent of the peak. The climb is perfectly easy. Here we have repetition by means of synonyms, where the word ascent is repeated by its synonymous term, which is the climb. Third example, Henry's bought himself a new Jaguar. He practically lives in the car. 
the word Jaguar was repeated by its superordinate term, which is the car. The second example of lexical cohesion is what we call collocation. It uses related words that typically go together or tend to repeat the same meaning. These words practically go in pair. For example, hair and comb, reader and writer, door and window, chair and table, north and south, peace and war, and bee and honey. Example sentence, why does little boy wriggle all the time? Girl don't wriggle. So here, the collocations boy and girl are used. Another important element to look for in doing as a fall is conjunction. Conjunction is also a type of cohesive device which purpose is to bind ideas together. We have four types of conjunctions. These are additive, causal, adversative, and temporal. Here are some examples of conjunctions. Their purpose is to add information, to compare and contrast, to show chronology and to show consequence. These examples show several ways to show cause and effect relationship. For example, he was insensitive, consequently, there was a bad feeling. Second example, he was insensitive, as a consequence, there was a bad feeling. Third example, as a consequence of his insensitivity, there was a bad feeling. The following examples will show us the versatility of the conjunction and. It can be used as an additive, adversative, causal, or temporal sequence. First example, she is intelligent and she is reliable. Here, the conjunction and is used to add additional information. Second example, I live here for 10 years and I have never heard of this pub. Conjunction and here is used to express antithesis or opposition. Third example, he fell in the river and caught a chill. The conjunction and here was used to show result. Fourth example, I got up and made my breakfast. And here was used to show order of events. Finally, ellipsis and substitution are also important elements in doing as a fell. They are used in living out words or phrases from sentences where they are unnecessary because they have already been referred to or mentioned. Ellipsis is the omission of elements required by the grammar, which the speaker or writer assumes are obvious from the context and therefore need not to be erased. To explain this, we have several examples. First example, the children will carry the small boxes, the adults the large ones. So instead of saying large boxes, the writer just used ones. Second example, the man went to the door and opened it. This is what we call subject ellipsis. Instead of saying he opened it, where the writer omitted the subject he. Third example, Omar ate the apple and Sarah pear. This is verb ellipsis. Instead of saying Sarah ate a pear, the verb ate was simply omitted. Substitution, on the other hand, is used for another language item. Here we use alternative or substitute terms. Substitution can be classified as nominal, verbal, and causal. In the nominal substitution, the most typical substitutional words are one and once, and they substitute nouns. For example, do you want the blankets? Yes, I'll take one. Here, the word one was used as a substitute for the word blankets. Another example of nominal substitution. Here, the word one was used to substitute the word blankets which also functions as a noun. Secondly, in verbal substitution, the most common substitute is the verb do. Example, did you sing? Yes, I did. Here, the word did is used as a substitute of sang, which functions as a verb. Another example, 
I went to lock the gate, but I found that somebody had already done so. Here, the phrase done so was used to substitute the verb phrase, which is lock the gate. Finally, in the clausal substitution, an entire clause is substituted. For example, the blankets needed to be cleaned. Yep, they did. Did was used as a substitute for the entire clause needed to be cleaned. To conclude, when using systemic functional linguistics or SFL, in discourse analysis of non literary text, we have to look for these important elements. These are Reference, conjunctions, substitutions, and ellipses, and lexical cohesions. This ends our second lesson. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope that you learned something significant today.